Hi, everyone, and welcome to A Journey to Postgres Productivity. I'm Johan. I'm a maintainer of the gRPC Gateway, Improbable's gRPC Web, and I run a blog writing mainly about Go and gRPC. I work at Buff, where we are reinventing the API economy. I'm here today to talk about state and Postgres, so let's dive right in. We're going to start with the question, why? What do we mean by state management and why do we need it? We're going to move on to talk about a few different state management solutions and discuss their various strengths and weaknesses. We're then going to dive deeper into my state management solution of choice, Postgres. Once there, we're going to explore some of the tooling available and narrow it down to the pieces I consider essential to becoming productive, productive with Postgres. At the end of this talk, we'll all be Postgres rock stars. So why do we need all of this? State management is the source of a lot of problems we have to deal with as programmers. If we didn't need to worry about state, we'd be able to effortlessly parallelize computation with no need for synchronization, no worrying about chronological ordering, etc. It's basically the reason why we can't have nice things. However, it's also the reason we can have some things. Facebook and Twitter wouldn't be much without the ability to share text and images. And Google would struggle to be useful if it had to search for the whole internet every time you made a search. State management is, unfortunately, here to stay. So we need to store data. How do we store data? We could just store things in memory, create a struct, store some data in a map or slice like this, and we're done. Storing in memory also means it's super fast to access. But what about when we need to restart our application to update it? All our data is lost. What about when we want to run several applications? They can't share memory between each other. Storing data in memory is sometimes useful, but it's not a great solution for many problems. So in memory is out. What about just storing files on the file system? <clears throat> the files on the file system persist across application restarts and can be shared between processes. Problem solved. Sure, things aren't as fast as when we were storing data in memory anymore, but that was a compromise we had to accept. Using the file system is not a terrible idea for some problems, but it also has its shortcomings. As you can see in this snippet, we've already had to make a decision about how to store the data on the file system. What about when we want to find all users who are over a certain age, or all users whose name begins with T? This and many other problems are solved for us when we use a purpose-built data store. Generally, as a programmer, any time you need to store data for longer than the lifetime of your application, you should turn to a data store. These are applications that have solved many of the hard problems associated with persisting large amounts of data, ensuring safe concurrent access, easy access to read data, filtering of results, etc. Let's look at a few different types of data stores. Data stores can be broadly split into three categories, all with different properties and use cases. These are in-memory key value stores, document stores, and relational databases. There are, of course, exceptions to these classifications, but we're only going to cover these three today. What's an in-memory key value store? In-memory key value stores are typically implemented to allow quick access to small amounts of data tied to a specific key. You can think of them as a distributed Go map. They are often used as caches because of their speed, but they are not meant to hold very complex data structures and often don't support sophisticated filtering of results. They are also obviously limited to whatever the size your machine memory is. Example of key value stores are memcached, redis, and others. Having said all of that, a key value store may well suit your needs, whatever they are. Speaking personally as someone who implemented sophisticated logic in redis, using its Lua engine, go nuts, but make sure you're optimizing for the right thing. I was not. Okay, but what is a document store? 
document stores typically use the file system and sit somewhere between a key value store and relational database in terms of performance. <coughs> These are usually so-called no SQL data stores, which means that they don't require a predefined schema to work. Basically, you insert some JSON and you've got your data store. You can insert more JSON of the same format and quickly read it out again. These data stores are normally built with large-scale deployments in mind and automatically split the data between its servers. The compromise that some document stores make to provide high performance is that some data may be missing or incorrect. MongoDB, Couchbase, and Elasticsearch are examples of document stores. <clears throat> MongoDB especially has gained some fame recently for its dubious claims about data consistency. Renowned database researchers Jepsen.io had the following to say about MongoDB. MongoDB lost data and violated causal consistency by default. I don't want to throw shade on all document stores, but maybe don't use MongoDB if you value data accuracy. Finally, we have relational databases. <clears throat> These use the file system for storing data, provide strong data guarantees, and use the structured query language, aka SQL, for inserting and reading data. They are often backed by decades of development and testing. They also tend to provide so-called ACID transactions, which basically means that your data will not get corrupted if something happens while you're writing. Naturally, speed is a secondary concern after data integrity, so they are normally not as fast as a document store. Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres, and CockroachDB are examples of relational databases. <laughs> relational database trivia, MySQL and MariaDB are created by the same author, and they are both named after one of his daughters, Mi and Maria, respectively. So MySQL should really be pronounced MySQL. Thanks, I hate it. All right, with that background out of the way, let's talk business. Which data store should we use? Postgres, obviously. For most problems, Postgres is a great alternative. It's been around for over 20 years, is free, open source, and used by thousands of companies worldwide. Importantly for us, it also has excellent Go library support. For basically anything but in-memory caches, I tend to lean on Postgres. If you need to scale your database to several machines, CockroachDB implements the same wire protocol as Postgres, so it can often be used as a drop-in replacement. Postgres can be run on its own in the cloud, or you can use one of the managed Postgres solutions, which exist in pretty much every cloud provider. I like that defining the database schema makes you think about how the data fits together, so it's a bit like going from writing Python to writing Go, and it can save you a lot of trouble in the long run. So how do we use Postgres with Go? Naturally, the first place we look is the standard library, and indeed, we are not disappointed. Go has a few packages dedicated to work with SQL databases. <clears throat> The database slash SQL package is a great starting point and is designed to work with any SQL database by offloading database-specific behavior to specialized third-party drivers. In theory, this means you can simply change the driver when you want to use a different database backend. Whether that theory holds up in practice is another question. It also comes with a connection pool and special types for handling null in rows returned from the database. This example here is an abbreviated version of one from the SQL page on the Go GitHub wiki. So what's the problem if we can just use the standard library? Let's break down what's happening in this code snippet. <clears throat> the first thing we see is a blank import, which means any effect this library has on your application is through the init function, a notoriously obscure and often confusing mechanism that is regularly avoided entirely by users. How do you, as a user, from just that import, find out what the library does to your application? You have to read through the whole source of the library to find the init function. Next, we have the generic string parameter to the sql.db methods. A novice user might use something like fmt.sprintf to fill this string with some user-supplied information 
without realizing that this opens their application up to SQL injection, one of the most devastating security vulnerabilities possible in the application layer. <coughs> this is not an error, though the docs make it reasonably clear that you should use positional parameters for user-supplied data. That brings us to the next point. Want to know that the type you're passing to the method matches the data type of the positional parameter? Not with the standard library APA, API. It's empty interfaces all the way. Then there's the various error methods, rows.close and rows.error. I hope you don't forget to call them both in the right order and checking their errors respectively, something this example doesn't actually take care of in the case of rows.close. <laughs> OK, so the standard library API doesn't protect us from certain errors. What other tooling is there to help with this? Unfortunately, we're presented with a myriad of options for tooling, and choosing the right tool requires a lot of testing and evaluation. Should we use an ORM? Should we generate the code? Should we use a query builder? What driver should we use? How do we perform database version migrations? How do we gain confidence in our code through testing? Let's take a quick look at some of the types of tools available. <coughs> You've probably heard of Object Relational Mapping ORM libraries, of which there are mapped many. These try to provide an interface to the database that doesn't require writing or understanding SQL, which can be very appealing to beginners. However, ORMs often become messy when working with more complicated data structures and can lead to inefficient queries being made to the database. Furthermore, the lack of generics in Go means that they generally have to sacrifice static typing. ORMs are also often unable to support all the features of the databases they abstract away, as they naturally aim to provide a database agnostic interface. Working with an ORM can feel a little bit like magic when it works, but I recommend learning to use SQL directly. It will pay dividends in the long run. Then there are generator libraries. These will generally require you to provide some sort of markup to define your data structures. It could be SQL, it could be in the form of Go code, or maybe something else. It will then generate structs and helper functions for writing and reading to the database. They are able to provide a type safe interface to the database, as opposed to an ORM, but it's hard for a generator to cover all the features supported by Postgres, so it's usually a non-starter for me. More on that later. Finally, we have query builders. These are so-called, these are using the so-called builder pattern, aka a fluent interface. They're usually easy to use, and especially when you have access to the editor auto completion, they can feel quite magical to work with. They automatically parameterize queries, so you don't have to worry about SQL injection. However, because they tend to be designed to work with such a wide range of different queries and types, they have to sacrifice type safety, so you often end up with a lot of empty interface parameters. Query builders shine when you want to build very dynamic queries. <coughs> All right, so now that we've been introduced to many of the alternatives, what tooling are we going to use? I know you're not watching this talk to hear about theory, so I'm going to give you my own recommendations. After years of trying different libraries and methods for interacting with Postgres, I had identified four tools that complemented each other very well, each solving a separate issue. They were PGX, Golang Migrate, Squirrel, and Docker Test. I was happy, but it's important to never stop learning, and I was recently introduced to another alternative tool that I'm so pleased with that I'm going to add this to my list of recommendations. That tool is SQLC. Let's take a closer look at each of these tools and how they fit together. We're now going to be diving in and out of my example repo a bit, so if you want to, feel free to clone my example repo now. It should come as a surprise to no one who has seen any of my other talks that my Postgres example repo is also a gRPC server. I'll give you a little more time to write down the name. Let's take a quick look at the structure of my example repo. OK, we're di diving into the readme of the repo. You can see that it just talks about how to use it to start with. So it uh, encourages you to start a database in the background, and then you can run your Go, the Go server to connect to the database. Now, I've already started the database in the background, so I'm just going to run the Go server now. 
And as you can see, this spits out lots of log messages and uh, essentially ends up serving both the gRPC and a web UI. And we're not going to use either of those, but as you can see, everything worked properly there. Let's quickly take a look at the main.go. This is a gRPC server, so it sets up uh, a few things at the start here, uh, certificates and uh, in MUX, so that we can serve both HTTP and gRPC. <clears throat> and then if we scroll down to, uh, let's see here, we're, we're calling users.new directory, which is the entry point to the application. New directory implements the gRPC interface. So that's where most of the logic lives. So let's jump into that now. Here you can see that this is implements this type called directory, and the directory has some uh, makes some connection and a connection to the database and sets up some variables here. And we can see we have add user, add users, delete user, and list users. Now we're going to dive into each one of those a little bit closer in a minute. <clears throat> and we're also going to look at a few extra files over on here. But that's basically the gist of the repo. Let's jump back into the presentation. Let's look a little bit closer at my database driver of choice, jackc slash pgx. PGX is a pure Go driver for the standard library database slash SQL interface that also implements its own interface to squeeze that extra bit of performance out when you need it. I tend to use the slightly slower standard library interface for compatibility and familiarity. It has support for over 70 Postgres types, such as UUID, HStore, JSON, ByteArray, Interval, and Arrays. It can be used with SQL Open, but also supports a custom type for configuring things like TLS and debug logging of queries, as can be seen here. And that was also what we saw previously in the example repo. The logging interface logs all queries and has adapters for popular logging libraries such as Logros, Zap, ZeroLog, and Log15. You probably don't want this turned on all the time, but it can be a great help when debugging some queries. Let's take a closer look at the custom API. At any time, if you need to do something that could take advantage of the extra speed offered by the custom API, such as when you want to insert a large amount of data, you can acquire a pgx.con from an sql.db as seen in this example. You can then do the intensive operation while maintaining the use of the normal database slash SQL interface for familiarity and compatibility elsewhere. The benchmarks here are from two alternative methods implemented in my example repo. Let's take a closer look at the example repo implementations. I'm just going to talk a little bit about this instantiation again here. We had a slide that showed roughly this, but as you can see, this accepts a URL, and indeed the URL that we saw on the terminal just a minute ago is, uh, it looks like that, PostgreSQL slash blah, blah, blah. And it, we give it to pgx.parseconfig, and that returns us a initialized config. We can then make changes to the config, like add a logger, uh, which we're doing in this case, and then we can call stdlib, which is part of the pgx library, dot open db on the config, and that actually returns an sql.db to us. So we don't have to use sql.open. We're then doing a bit of scheme operations that we're going to look at later. And finally, we are creating the directory with a, a few things here that we're also going to dive into a little bit later. But let's jump into the add users method. So you saw the benchmark there showing literally more than a magnitude uh, order of magnitude speed improvement when using add users over the add user call for inserting many users. So let's have a quick look at this. As you can see, we're, we're grabbing a con from the database. This is an SQL DB. And then we have to make sure they close that con, which returns it to the database pool. We're then calling con.raw. And within con.raw, we can operate on the database driver connection. <clears throat> so we're doing a type assertion there, and then we're using the con.copyfrom, which is a method that uses the Postgres copy protocol to perform data bulk insertion. And indeed, we saw in the benchmark there just how much faster this is. And this is a little bit of an interesting case, because if you looked really closely at this function definition, this is actually a, a client streaming method. So this is if you're transferring a lot of data from one gRPC server to another gRPC server, you might use something like client streaming. And in this case, we're actually writing an implementation of this interface here called uh, copy from source using the receive method on the list um, 
call. So let's quickly jump into uh, user source here and just see what that actually means. It means basically implementing uh, the iterator pattern, which you may be familiar from other libraries and parts of the standard library. So you have to implement this next function and a values function and an error function. <clears throat> and that's all you need. So in this case, we're actually implementing a next function that calls this get user function, which is the <laughs> rec v function on the client streaming method that, that we've implemented in the interface. So every time the copy source uh, user calls next, it actually calls recv on the gRPC uh, client streaming interface. So this is, there's no kind of buffering in between here. We're basically writing straight into the database from the client streaming method. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased with how this works actually. So. Uh, I thought that was really cool. <clears throat> so that's a really interesting example of how you can use PGX to implement uh, high-speed uh, insertions when you need it. Let's jump back to the slides. Before we dive into the next tool, let's talk a little bit about migrations. When I first started learning about databases, it wasn't clear to me why you need migrations. Migrations are, in the simplest case, useful for migrating from nothing to an initial database schema and back. We're going to look at an example of this in a minute. The second use case for migrations is when you have some existing data, but you need to evolve the schema, such as adding a column to an existing table or adding another table altogether, and you need to do something to the existing data, such as setting a value on the new column based on current values or inserting a row in the new table. The third thing it can be useful for is when a planned change didn't go as well as desired and you need to roll back the changes. My choice of migration library is Golang Migrate. It supports reading migration files from a number of sources and writing to a number of different databases. Though of course we only care about Postgres for this example. It can be run both via a command line interface or inside an application on startup. The examples we're going to look at today will be using it inside the application. Note that this means that we are tying the version of the database to the schema, database schema to the application, which means you have to be careful if you're running several applications against the same database. If you're using a single client per database, it is the easiest way of managing migrations though. First up, we have to write migration files. In the simplest case, this is just the initial database schema. If your application is small and doesn't need to change, this may be all you need. If you, even if you don't anticipate that you will need to migrate the data in the future, I would still recommend using migrations from the start, just because they allow you to easily control the state of the database schema. The initial up migration creates the first table or tables, and the initial down migration is an exact inverse of that, that is, it deletes the tables again. So there's nothing in the database. This adds another benefit, which is that you can clean out the database state by just running the migrations down to zero, though you only really want to do that in tests because it removes all the data in the database. <laughs> so let's add an up migration here that creates a single table and a down migration that deletes it again. Note the naming of the files. They need to be named so that the migrations can be ordered lexicographically. This is often accomplished by using a numbered prefix, as seen here. 001. Next up, we have the question of how to integrate the migrations into our application. And for that, we will use the bin data generator. If you've never heard of Go bin data before, it's basically a way of taking some files on the file system and making the content importable as a Go package. This means we no longer depend on the file system, so an application can be shipped around as a single executable. We can take this command here which runs go bin data to create the bin data.go file, stick it in a make file or a go generate directive, and then import it using it in our migrations, like so. This reuses an existing sql.db to do the migration to version one, creating our table. Let's take a look at how this is integrated in the example repo. So as you can see now, we're back in the new directory function and we're going to jump into this validate schema method that we had talked about before, but we never really looked at. So validate schema looks very much like the function that we just looked at in the slide, where it creates a bin data instance, uh, it loads a Postgres instance, and then it uses bin data to migrate to the version that we have set here. <clears throat> 
And this does all the migrations. But where are the migrations? Well, let's jump out to the file system and have a look. We have the migrations here. So we can look at the up migration and the down migration. And we can see that the up migration here basically sets up the entire database schema. It starts by creating an enum for the uh, roles that we support in the database. And then we have a user table here that has a, an ID, role, create time, and a name. And if we take a quick look at the down schema migration, all of that does is drop table if exists users, and then drop type role. So that literally just cleans up everything that we added here. So if you run them immediately after each other, then you're going to end up with absolutely nothing in your database. And then if we go to the make file, we can see where we're running this go generate script. This is uh, right here. Go bin data, uh, pkg migrations, blah, blah, blah. This is how we create the mi uh, migration bin data file. And then that actually creates this file here, which has package migrations, which is how we end up importing it here. You can see we're importing the package migrations to get access to the migration data. So that's how you set up your bin data migrations. Once we have a driver and a database schema, we can start writing queries. And for that, we will use SQLC. SQLC is nothing short of a landmark achievement in Go database APIs. The summary is that it generates idiomatic Go code from SQL queries. But just how it does that is the really interesting part. I mentioned before how generators are often not able to support the full capabilities of the database they are built on. How does SQLC work around that issue? Well, it includes the real Postgres query parser as part of its parsing. This allows it to parse anything that Postgres would consider valid SQL. This was obviously a tremendous amount of work, but it also works incredibly well. It prevents you from a whole class of errors by matching your SQL queries against your schema definitions. Let's take a look at what that looks like in the example repo. So the first place we're going to look is this sqlc.yaml file. And this is where you define things that allows the SQLC generator to know where to look for queries and schemas. So as you can see, we have to define a name, uh, a path. This is essentially the output path, a place for where it can look for the queries, a place where it can look for the schema, and also what type of SQL schema it can expect to find. And then we have some overrides down here as well. So let's look at those one by one. Let's jump into the queries folder. In the queries folder, we have this file called users.sql. And this actually defines the different methods that we want to use on the, uh, against the database in pure SQL. This, there's no Go involved here at all. We're writing SQL uh, as if we were you know, on the PSQL um, CLI. So this, uh, this is just pure SQL. And the cool thing about SQLC is not only does it use these uh, SQL annotations to generate queries, if you will remember here, it also has a schema provider, and it is actually able to look at Go bin data migrations to find the types of fields used in the tables that are defined. So if we jump back to users.sql here, <clears throat> when I say insert role into users, role name values one, two, SQLC can look at role and name in the table users and look it up based on the schema migrations and say, okay, role is of type role and name is of type text and automatically generate the correct types. Not only that, if we tried to use the name uh, nam here, which is a pretty innocent error, you know, it's a typo, it happens. If we now try and generate the code, we get an error at generation time saying that there's a typo in your SQL. And the only way that it actually is able to do that is by looking through the entirety of the schema to find that all the names match up with the names that you want to use. And then the same thing here, if you misspelled the, the users table, let's call it user again uh, instead, and then we run make generate, syntax error after near user. Okay, that's, that's not a great error, but essentially it can tell you at generation time, this query is not going to work. This is so far beyond what any other Go database API I've used is able to do that it's an 
unambiguously the best choice for these simple types of queries. So let's let's quickly jump look at what the generated code looks like. So when we run SQLC generate, we generate this users.sql, <clears throat> which uh, essentially looks like what it would look like if you were writing the code yourself. It defines a constant string here, which is the query. So there's no risk of SQL injection here because they're constants. And add user just does, you know, it operates on a uh, SQL.db, which is stored in the queries type, and calls query row context. You know, always uses a context and it does a scan. So this is essentially how you would write this if you were writing it yourself. Looks like nice idiomatic Go code, but it's all generated. Again, if we jump down to the delete user, these are both very simple queries, but you can do very complicated SQL queries with SQLC and it doesn't bat an eye because it has the Postgres query parser built into it. So anything that Postgres considers valid SQL, SQLC is going to be able to swallow. And there's another little detail that you may have noticed in the SQLC uh, generation, which is that I defined a specific type that I wanted to use for the DB type UUID, which is this Jaxi PG type UUID. By default, the UUID type used by the SQLC is the Google slash UUID type, but I prefer using the PG types from uh, Jaxi, who is also the author of PGX. The other types that uh, other methods that are generated by uh, SQLC is this querier interface which is uh, used for, uh, so you can use this to store it in your database uh, handler. And we also have the models, uh, which generates the, the types that are used. So this is basically entirely based on the schema. So if you remember, we jump back to schema quickly, we created a role type here, which is an enumeration uh, with the values guest member and admin. And lo and behold, this again, generates this perfectly idiomatic, beautiful code based on just that definition there. And as you can see, this is what it would look like basically exactly like this if I was writing it myself. And again, the user type looks just really nice. Um, the, the generated code is really state of the art. I, I don't have any complaints whatsoever. And so the way that you use it, if we jump into um, the user's file, you could see we were doing this uh, new, which is uh, a little bit cheeky. Normally you would probably generate this into a separate directory, but this new function here, we can use to create a new queries type. <clears throat> and it's an exact, it expects a DB interface. So you could use this, you can use it both with a transaction and with uh, the DB itself. You just need to implement these uh, four functions here. And then if we look at exactly what it looks like to call these methods, we can look at add user. And as you can see, this is just query.addUser it takes some parameters. Uh, if there's a single parameter, it doesn't even add this params type. It just accepts a parameter uh, directly on the uh, interface. And it returns uh, this beautifully well-typed uh, type back to you. So you get basically static typing by making sure that the names match up. You get the beautifully idiomatic code generated and you get this perfectly uh, well, well-typed uh, types back from it as well. Uh, so SQLC is, is really something I can't recommend enough. Let's jump back to the slides. There are still some things that SQLC struggles with. Sometimes we want to build more dynamic queries and we don't know what column filters we want to use while writing the code. Sometimes we want to reverse the order. Sometimes we want to limit it to a variable number. And sometimes we want to filter by a specific value of a column. How do we do that when we're required to write out the exact queries ahead of time? There was a discussion on the issue tracker, and right now it seems there are two options. You write an SQL query for each of the variants or use SQL case statements. Both end up quite annoying, and in the end, my recommendation is to not use SQLC for these types of queries, at least not until there's a better solution for this problem. To that end, I've got another querying tool in mind. Squirrel is a query builder utilizing the builder pattern to add properties to the query. The builder pattern isn't something you see often in Go because it sacrifices static typing a lot of the time. And Squirrel is no exception. I would generally not recommend the builder pattern, but Squirrel strikes a very good balance between power and type safety. The code on the screen here shows a very simple example of using Squirrel. Parameters 
automatically become positional parameters which prevents SQL injection vulnerabilities. It aims to support most of the stand SQL standard. This can be extended to arbitrarily complex queries with joins, Postgres, suf specific suffixes, etc. This example creates a query which selects all the rows from the users table, which have the name Johan. We then convert it into a query string and positional variables with two SQL. With that introduction out of the way, let me show you how this is used in the example repo. So we now find ourselves looking at this list users method. Just gonna close that. And as you can see, this is again, a special streaming method uh, on the gRPC server because it has this lists users server. And this is a server side streaming. So it means that it returns data in a stream to the user. And so this is uh, what I would consider a very dynamic query because we want to sometimes filter by a create time, sometimes filter by a uh, by how old something is. We can look at the request here and we have the parameters created since and older than. And sometimes we want neither of them and sometimes we want both and sometimes we only want one of them. And both of those are also variables. So the normal case is that we just do this select ID role create time name from users order by create time. This looks a bit like a SQL query, so I quite like that. And then if we say that the created since is specified, we also want to add that to the query. And we can do that very dynamically by doing this q.where squirrel greater than create time pg time. So we're doing a conversion from the um, <clears throat> protobuf timestamp into a Postgres timestamp here. And this squirrel.gt is a comparison to greater than. So in this case, we're returning all of the rows that contain, that have a create time greater than the time we've expired. So essentially created since. And then we also have get older than, which is using the duration type. And in the, the duration equivalent in Postgres is called an interval. So we use the Postgre PGX interval type to uh, convert the time.duration that we're getting as a parameter. And then we're using a squirrel.expert here to uh, calculate how old a specific row is from the create time. So you can do something like current timestamp minus create time is greater than PG interval to get exactly how old something is. And of course, if we wanted to do something like this in SQLC, we would probably have to write out, I'd say four different versions at least. But depending on if we want to make it even more dynamic, it would be even worse. So while SQLC provides a lot of benefits and generally writing something with uh, Squirrel instead makes me a little bit nervous because you're now all of a sudden uh, having to write it manually, which makes it li more likely that you're gonna make an error, then uh, for these kind of cases, it's still more appropriate, I think. So we have to write this rows.next. You'll all be very familiar with this. This looks like a normal database operation with a Go standard library. Um, and scan, and then we're doing a conversion. And then in this case, because this is a GRPC server streaming method, we can just, instead of you know getting all of the users back and sending them all out in a bulk, we can actually stream them out one by one as we read it from the database. So this is kind of conversely to what we were doing with add users, where we were streaming straight into the database. Here, we're actually streaming straight out of the database again. And then rows of error. So the, the thing I would say when using something like uh, Squirrel instead of SQLC, where you, you lose a bit of safety, uh, make sure that you're testing that method very carefully. Because if I had a ty typo in here, and it was something like that instead, create time, that might be missed in the uh, code review, and I wouldn't see it until at runtime. So we have to make sure that we're being a little bit more careful with our SQL expressions here, because there's no one holding our hand like with SQLC. So let's jump back to the slides. Now we've got the application up and running and talking to the database using PGX, writing migrations with Golang Migrate and writing queries with SQLC and Squirrel. There is still one more piece to the puzzle. How do we test that our code does what we want it to? There exist several solutions to testing code that interacts with the database, such as mocking the database slash SQL interface or using an interface and perform testing against that. But I'm here to tell you that there is a better option. What if we could test against a real database? Docker test does exactly what it says on the tin. It allows you to test against a Docker container. 
This allows us to run tests against a real Postgres server. It can be called from normal test code like any Go library and uses the Docker API under the hood. So all you need is a local Docker socket. You can configure the tests to automatically clean up containers after finishing or leave them up, allowing for debugging after tests run. It comes with a convenience function to test that a container has started and it can support advanced use cases like uploading files to the test containers and reading the log output for debugging. It works just as well in local testing and CI, so no more need for CI-specific container configuration. The only requirement is that your CI runner has access to a local Docker socket so that it can both start containers and connect to them via the local network. In CI, this means using custom runners or this may mean using custom runners or something like a CircleCI machine runner. Let's take a look at a real example in the example repo. So now we found ourselves in this users underscore test file, and we are immediately looking at a function called start database. And as you can see, this takes a testing.tb, which is an interface that is implemented both by testing.t and testing.b, meaning this function can be used both in tests and benchmarks and a logger, and it returns a URL. It doesn't even have to return an error. And we'll see in, in a second how that works. And the first thing we're doing is defining a Postgres URL, and we're setting the user and password that we want to use, and as well as the database. And we're also disabling SSL because that's enabled by default in PGX. We're then creating a new pool with Docker test, and that essentially doesn't really do anything. It just means you can uh, keep things in together in, in the same pool and close it off uh, together uh, later. <clears throat> and then we're extracting the username and password that we saved before and setting those to environment variables that we will use to configure the database that we're starting. And when we call pool.run, this actually pulls down the Postgres container under tag 13-alpine and gives it these environment variables. This starts a Docker container on your local Docker socket. We're then calling tb.cleanup here, which is a function that was added in Go 113 to, to help clean up uh, resources after a test has run. So this is <clears throat> a way for us to not have to defer things uh, in a uh, main test main function, for example. We can instead use tb.cleanup, which is much cleaner. We're then getting the IP address of the container that we just started, because that's what we're going to use to connect to the container in the test. And then we have a little bit of special handling here for Mac because things work a little bit differently on Mac for reasons. <clears throat> Finally, we are creating a log connection here to get the log output of the container so that we can view it in our tests in case there is something relevant there for a test failure that we had that was unexpected. We're doing a little bit of cleanup afterwards. And then down here, the last thing we do before returning is making sure that the database has started by the time we return this from this function. So we're calling pool.retry, which is going to call the function that we're passing to it over and over again until it doesn't return an error. And it does that on the back off. So it will first call it immediately and then call it a few milliseconds later and then a few tens of milliseconds later. So it kind of gradually steps up how long it waits in between. And so Postgres easily starts up within 10 seconds. So I'm just setting max wait to 10 seconds. But if you're using something like Elasticsearch, this actually takes up to 30 seconds to start, which kind of blew my mind. It can, yeah. So Postgres is great in that regard. It starts almost immediately. So let's have a look at how we're using that. We have a function here called test add delete user, which as it says on the tin, will test adding and then deleting a user. And now we can use the users.new directory and simply pass it the start database function result immediately. As you remember, it takes a URL parameter. And so th this is going to start the database and then immediately create a, a new directory on top of that. And again, we can use the cool cleanup functions. And then we can start running some subtests here. And all of these tests that we have defined here are running in parallel. And you can run, you can imagine running, you know, tens or tens of different tests against the same database here. But you can also create in each one of these functions, you can create a separate database. So if we look at the test list users, which wants to you know, add some users and then list them. And it doesn't want to be interfered with by other tests that may add and delete users while it's running. It actually creates another database. So every time you run start database, it will create a container and give you the URL to it. <clears throat> so both of these tests actually create their own databases, which means that they don't have to worry about state being left around by other tests and they can run in parallel without any problems. <clears throat> 
And if we just jump down here, we have a test for add users, which is the streaming method. Um, and we're going to just leave that as is. But we, if you want to tweak this uh, on your own, you can actually set this numbers to something like 100,000 users, and it's still running very, very quickly. And at the bottom here, we have the benchmarks, but we're not going to run those today because they take up a little bit too much time. But I wanted to show you just how quickly this actually runs when we run the go and test. So you can imagine, hey, I can't run this uh, in my application because it's going to take you know many seconds for the container to start, and then it has to close it down as well before the test actually finishes. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. Fortunately, if we run, okay, <laughs> of course that's going to run immediately. Uh, let's set that to count equals one, and then let's see what happens here. 4.1 seconds. Now, if you can't wait 4.1 seconds, and that being including starting two different containers, uh, getting all of the confidence that you can get when running tests against a real database, no mocking here. If you had a query error in list users, as we were talking about, you would detect that here immediately. You're running against a real database. I can tell you this is going to be worth it every single time. I have stopped doing any sort of database mocking or interfacing because you can just run a database container. It's so easy. <clears throat> Let's jump back to the slides and, and summarize what we've talked about. In summary, we started out by looking at state management and why we need data stores. We learned about a few different data storage solutions, such as Redis, Elasticsearch, and Postgres. We learned about the five libraries I consider essential to becoming proficient with Postgres in Go. That is PGX, Golang Migrate, SQLC, Squirrel, and Docker Test. And looked at an example that incorporated all of the different tools. Putting all of it together, we've become Postgres rockstars and ready to be productive with Postgres the next time we need to store some state. I hope this talk has given you the confidence and desire to try out Postgres with Go. It's something I enjoy every time I do it. Thank you.